Hi, I'm Christine Dreschler, and welcome to our second Zoom Parenting University for 2020. Zoom has expanded our reach, so a special hello to everyone joining us from outside the Chicagoland area. Parenting University offers orthodox perspective, learning, and inspiration on current topics to support orthodox families in their parenting journey. I'll begin by thanking our Chicago Metropolis Family CNXC Spiritual Director, Father Sam Dimitriou, for his guidance and support, as well as the entire Family CNXC's team. And Father would like to open us with prayer. Thank you, Christine. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. On behalf of Parenting You, I welcome all of you. And thank you, Christine, for the introduction. And I give it back to you. Okay. Um, first, please mark your calendars for our next event. It's a one-day, in-person COVID Safe Couples Retreat on Saturday, November 14th. We have a special guest speaker flying in, so book your babysitters now and watch for more details coming soon. Also, I want you to know at the end of this presentation, um, Dr. Anderson will be, has prepared some materials that you'll receive by email, so be prepared to look for those. Now I'll introduce tonight's team. Theophanis Rauch, our Chicago Metropolis office admin and technology guru, is managing the Zoom presentation for us. We have Tony Milak from our Family CNXC's planning team. She will be facilitating the questions that you submit. And when you submit a question in the chat box, you'll be invited to state your question personally, or Tony will read it for you. And now I'll go on to introduce our special speaker for tonight. It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Randa Anderson. She is a licensed clinical psychologist who treats individual adults, adolescents, and children in her private practice with offices in Gurney, Park Ridge, and via telehealth. She is a member of the Orthodox Christian Counseling Institute in Chicago, and their website is on the, page, on the resources you'll be receiving tonight. Throughout her life, Dr. Anderson has been actively involved in Orthodox ministries, including 12 years as the church school director at Saints Peter and Paul in Glenview, Illinois. She currently serves on the board of the Orthodox Christian Association of Medicine, Psychology, and Religion, as well as on the Task Force on Mental Health of the Assembly of Canonical Orthodox Bishops. Dr. Anderson has presented seminars and retreats at many parishes across the pan-Orthodox community in the Chicago area. She feels passionate about integrating concepts from psychology and orthodoxy in ways that can be practically applied to everyday life. And you'll see in this presentation that she really shines in this area. Dr. Anderson has also recorded podcasts for Come Receive the Light on the Orthodox Christian Network, as well as for Family Matters on Ancient Faith Radio. So now I'm pleased to present Dr. Amanda Anderson. Thank you, Christine, for that warm welcome. Let me share my screen so we can get these slides up and then we'll get started. All right, everyone can see it? So again, thank you for inviting me um, to speak with you tonight. I'm truly honored to address this wonderful Family Synaxis ministry. Recently, I was invited to speak at a webinar for the National Philoptikos, specifically on the impact of COVID-19 on education in the family. This talk tonight picks up on many of those same themes because in talking with the Family Synaxis Committee, we agree that the information and message is relevant to everyone, especially now that the school year is underway. So if you happen to have heard the Philoptikos talk, you are going to hear some of the same points, but I have added plenty of new content tonight to make it even more focused on families. So here's the plan for tonight. We're aiming to offer some encouragement for how to get through these unprecedented times by leaning on our faith and each other. 
offer practical tips for getting through these challenging times and learn to truly thrive, not just survive. Along with this presentation tonight, as Christine mentioned, I have provided a resource page and two tip sheets that will be e emailed out to all of you after tonight's webinar. And last, we wanna offer a place to talk, listen, and share with others about today's challenges. And we're gonna use Zoom's interactive features to allow this discussion to happen. Throughout the talk tonight, you can communicate with me and the whole group in two ways. First, if you have a question, you can use the Q&A feature to submit your question. Or if you wanna comment, you can use the chat feature. And there will be times throughout my presentation when I will specifically ask for you all to comment if you wish. Tony and Christine will be monitoring the chat and Q&A and they will interact with me on your behalf at the appropriate times during this talk. We are leaving time at the end of my presentation for Q&A um, as well. And at that time, if you wanna ask your question yourself, you can let Tony and Christine know that and they will unmute you. We're also going to have some interaction tonight by taking polls at various points. So every so often you'll see a question pop up on your screen and you'll have a few seconds to answer it. The poll will give us immediate results and I'll be able to share those results with all of you. Um, and actually the first poll I'm going to put up right now and it'll help us know more about who is in the audience. So launching that poll, everyone can see it. Thumbs up if you can see it, yeah. Okay. Um, so go ahead and you're just gonna indicate how old the kids are in your house, infant toddler, preschool, elementary school, middle school, high school, college. Maybe you don't have kids or maybe your kids are grown and flown. Okay. Most of you have voted. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling. It looks like we have a wide range here of, um, oh, I think I can share results. Look at that. Can everyone see that? Yeah, you can share the results. All right. All right, we've got a nice range. Um, great. And my, my hope is to um, address points that will be relevant for everyone here tonight. So psychologists talk about how we've experienced this pandemic in stages. Last spring was the mad scramble to adjust to the sudden changes brought about by the pandemic. Then over the summer, we transitioned to adjusting our daily work and leisure activities to comply with COVID-19 restrictions and now it seems we might be in it for the long haul. We're not just buying masks to stay safe, we're buying cute ones that color coordinate with our clothes. It's just not clear how long the restrictions are going to last. We're living right now in a stage of ambiguity. It's like a long, boring car ride with your kids through miles of farmland and everyone is whining in the back seat. When will we get there? How much longer? Are we there yet? Problem is, we're not really sure where we're going and we definitely don't know when we will get there and be done with all these COVID-19 precautions. The stage of ambiguity we're in is causing significant anxiety for many, many people. It feels like something we can't control and for sure there are many aspects of this COVID-19 world that we cannot control but I'm a big believer in being proactive and looking around for what you can manage effectively in your life. So that is what we will talk about tonight. What can you do to thrive and not just survive? These two photos symbolize my two college age sons and represent the challenging educational situation that families find themselves in today. And that's having school either in person or online or some combination of both. The photo on the left represents my younger son, who is currently on his college campus, living in a dorm and taking most of his classes in person with his professors and peers. We sent him off to school this year with literally a gallon of hand sanitizer, a COVID-19 medical kit, and plenty of spray disinfectant. But all the disinfectant in the world 
doesn't protect us as parents from the worry we have felt with our son in a campus situation that puts him at greater risk to catch COVID-19 than if he simply stayed at home. His dorm has a big communal bathroom that he is sharing with 10 other guys. Seriously, that's kind of gross, even in normal times, much less now when we're worried about COVID-19 spreading. In contrast, our older son had planned to return to his university this fall, but his school revoked the housing contracts of all the juniors and seniors so they could give all the freshmen and sophomores single rooms. So instead, he is studying remotely from his childhood bedroom. Our parental worry for him is around whether or not his education will be compromised by going fully to e-learning, and how will a healthy 21-year-old, eager and ready to be independent, be impacted by another semester at home with mom and dad? While we are dealing with college students, the worries we have as parents are really not all that different from parents of younger kids. I believe we all have similar concerns. Whether they are staying at home to learn or returning to school in its much altered form with masks and social distancing, how might our kids' development, education, and mental health be impacted by the changes brought about by COVID-19? More importantly, what are some ways to cope with the many changes in our children's educational situations? I'm gonna spend much of my time tonight addressing the specifics about how to manage through this unusual school year and hopefully thrive, not just survive. I wanna acknowledge up front, there are many different scenarios possible. Some parents are working from home, some are not. Some kids are doing e-learning at home, some are not. And there are multiple combinations of what parents and kids are doing depending on the number of employed parents and the number of students in the home. And not in any way going to offer a one size fits all solution nor can I address each scenario specifically. What I'm hoping to do tonight is give a model for how to approach our new world of COVID-19 with all its restrictions, and I will leave how to fit my suggestions into your specific life scenario up to you. Before I talk about how to help your kids thrive this school year, I wanna address self-care for adults. That's right, I'm talking to you parents because before you can think about how to help your kids, you have to think about how you are going to take care of yourself as well. Think about this analogy. When you are on an airplane sitting next to your young child, if the cabin loses air pressure and the oxygen masks drop down, we are told as parents to put on our own oxygen mask first and then to put the mask on our child. Self-care for parents is the oxygen mask. If we can't breathe, how will we be there for our children? we have to tend to ourselves. If you're not convinced that you need to take care of yourself first, let me share some stunning statistics from the National Center for Health Statistics. They wanted to gauge the impact of this year's current events on people's mental health, and they found that in July 2020, 30% of adults reported symptoms of depression compared with only 6.6 .6 last July. 36% of adults reported symptoms of anxiety this July versus 8% last year. Given all that has happened in 2020, these statistics do not surprise me at all. In fact, given the number of phone calls and emails I have fielded in the last few months from people seeking therapy for their anxiety, I'm really surprised these numbers aren't higher. Ladies and gentlemen, we absolutely must take care of ourselves. And to do that, I'd like us to consider what I'm going to call the new three R's for 2020. Now, why the three R's? Aren't the three R's the academic subjects of reading, writing, and arithmetic? What do these have to do with thriving or self-care? The three R's, as we've always known them, are fundamentals. They are the foundations on which all other academic disciplines are built. So today, I want to share some fundamentals of good mental health that I think will be crucial for us adults to get through the coming school year. So here are my three R's for adults. Reflect, rejuvenate, relationship. And actually, as I was preparing this talk, I noticed there are a lot more R words that are relevant to this discussion tonight. So tonight's presentation is brought to you by the letter R. 
and I offer it as a way to remember many of the points I will be making this evening. Let's start with the first star, reflect. Whenever you're faced with a challenge, it's a good idea to take a step back and reflect on, your hand, on how you're handling it. Reflect on the past to improve the present. Reflection leads to self-awareness and thoughtful, intentional action. When it comes to school, probably the most important thing to reflect on is last spring. What worked in your kid's school situation? What didn't? No one wants to repeat the frenzy that describes last March. So ask yourself how you can create a better learning situation for your family. And by family, I mean not just your kids, but for you too. In fact, let's reflect together a bit on how well the school year is going so far. Time for another Zoom poll. Let me launch it up here. So, so far my family's school year has been, go ahead and choose one, has it been smooth sailing, bumpy, crash and burn, how many days till Christmas break? Go ahead and pick one. I'm going to give it one more minute. If you can make a choice. Hopefully everyone is seeing the poll up there. All right. All right. Well, I'm going to end the polling. I see there's some people who haven't voted. Last chance. Okay, I'm gonna end the polling. All right, so as I expected for a majority of people, it's been a bumpy road so far. I'm very curious to hear what's going right for the people who, um, who said smooth sailing. Um, and actually I would ask you, those of you who said bumpy or crash and burn or really anyone, um, if you want to put comments in the chat regarding the one thing that is making the school year most difficult for you as the parent, you can take a minute to do that. Christine, if you see comments in the chat regarding the one thing that is making the school year most difficult, you want to just go ahead and read those out loud. Any sure thing? We haven't had any chats yet. Okay. I'll keep an eye on it. So the nice thing about the chat feature is if you're shy, you don't have to be seen on the screen. No one has to know you're watching this in your jammies. None of that. So if you uh, want to put a okay. comment, if you don't, we'll move on. Would you want me to read some of these, Randa? Yeah, please do. Okay, so we have constant change. Constant change. I'm exhausted trying to be IT support teacher and principal to my child while working at the same time. E-learning. My kids are doing well at in-person school, socializing and wearing masks. So that sounds like a, someone who's smooth sailing. One of those five who have yeah. smooth sailing. That's awesome. Changing schedules, now going to hybrid learning from remote, getting into a routine and then it changes again. So I'm hearing that the constant change and the tremendous demands are really making it challenging. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. And I think we're going to address most of those um, concerns as we move along tonight. Thank you. Okay. There we go. All right. So the second R is rejuvenate. When I talk about rejuvenate, I'm talking about stress management which could really be its own webinar. But tonight, I'm gonna to walk you through some basic stress management techniques from both modern psychology and through our Orthodox church practices. Believe it or not, when I talk with my clients about stress management, I always start with a physical assessment in these three key areas of diet, sleep, and exercise. 
If your body is regulated in these three areas, I promise you, you will be able to better manage your stress better. And actually, if you focus on a healthy diet and regular exercise first, the sleep habits will likely fall in line. Getting our physical body in proper working order is key to managing stressful times. I know most of you know this already in theory, but how well have you been applying these principles since the pandemic began? Have you ever tried breathing exercises to relax yourself when anxious? This is another physical intervention that can be very helpful when you feel stressed or anxious. You can find breathing exercises in apps like Calm and Headspace, which I've listed on the resource page. But basically, you simply close your eyes, focus on something pleasant, maybe you imagine your favorite beach or a beautiful sunset, and then slowly and intentionally breathe in and out. You can add calming words or prayer as well, so your thoughts relieve your stress too. Breathing exercises are especially helpful at night as you try to fall asleep. Reduce news intake. Do you really need to read every headline or follow the daily coronavirus numbers? Note how you feel after you read the latest election-related news and ask yourself if that information was actually helpful to you in some way. In fact, let's take another poll. I'm gonna launch it now. Okay, after reading the news or scrolling through my Facebook feed, I feel one, well-informed, two, dazed and confused, three, depressed and hopeless, four, ready to move to a small island with no internet. All right, go ahead and pick one. All right, we'll wait. All right, one more minute, a couple seconds actually. I don't want to take too long. Okay. All right, I'm going to end the polling and I'm going to share the results. Maybe we could all um, go in on buying a small island and moving there together because it looks like there's 10 people who are ready to leave. If you're feeling, um, if you're feeling dazed and confused, depressed and hopeless, or ready to move somewhere with no internet, it's possible you're doing something called doomsday scrolling. Have you heard this term, doomsday scrolling? This is when you scroll a website or your social media feed skimming for alarming news stories and only stopping to read the negative news. Needless to say, this brings you down, not up, and I'm afraid it's a bad habit that many people have to consciously work on breaking. All right, pay attention to what you're thinking about and reframe your negative thinking. If you find yourself going down the rabbit hole of worry and rumination, best to stop what you're doing and challenge those worrisome thoughts. As St. Paisio said, is everything really the way it appears to you? Always put a question mark after every thought since you usually look at things with a negative slant. If you put two question marks, it is better. If you put Three, it is better still. Take time to nurture your spiritual health with prayer and spiritual reading. While today's culture talks a lot about meditation, consider that our Orthodox Church has offered a rule of prayer that can work wonders for reducing stress. St. John Chrysostom said, prayer is the place of refuge for every worry, a foundation of cheerfulness, a protection against sadness. Prayer doesn't have to be long and drawn out. Think about it. Lord have mercy is the simplest and most powerful prayer we have as Orthodox Christians. And when you stop and say it throughout your day, it can be very comforting and grounding. Taking this idea of prayers being short and sweet, I want to share with you the concept of arrow prayers. An arrow prayer is what it sounds like, a short, simple prayer that gets right to the point 
and can be said constantly throughout the day, especially in times of need. St. John Cassian defines an arrow prayer as a formula that can be easily repeated several times a day by people preoccupied by other tasks. That's us, right? Preoccupied by other tasks. Of course, the most well-known arrow prayer is the one I just mentioned, the Jesus prayer. Arrow prayers were introduced by the Desert Fathers, and here are two. Abba Isaiah used to encourage his monks to say, be willing to help me, O Lord, because I am weak and cannot keep up this battle. St. John Cassian had a favorite, and it is, it is from Psalm 70. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Can you imagine saying either of these two prayers while trying to help your kid get through their math homework or the jet dreaded science project? An arrow prayer should be one that flows easily and is very relevant to you in your life situation. So I encourage each of you to find an arrow prayer that you can say to assist in your self-care, especially during this challenging time. I'll share with you my favorite arrow prayer. Always before I do a presentation like this one tonight, I will pray easily. Oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your, your praise. Again, think about the power and comfort of praying this psalm when you are confronted with a challenge and talking with your child. Take that moment and say this arrow prayer asking God to guide your words. Let's talk about the third R now, relationship. Humans are made to be in relationship with each other and with God. So I want to offer some thoughts here. First, with regard to your children, please remember that you are a parent first and their e-learning teacher second. If you feel conflicted about the two roles, make a commitment to being mom or dad first and teacher second. That is what they need from you now more than ever. Remember to enjoy your children. Play a game with your kids or engage in imaginary play with your younger ones. Play school and let them be the teacher for once. Build with Legos or blocks, throw a baseball in the backyard. Most importantly, let them choose what you play and do not direct the play. Here's a little challenge. See if you can play for a half hour straight without teaching, guiding, or correcting them on how they are behaving. Just sit and enjoy the play for what it is. If you're a parent of a teen or a college student, find a family game you all enjoy, and your challenge is to be able to play a game without making one critical comment to your kid while you're playing. None of this, sit up straight, or you need a haircut, or when are you gonna apply for that job? I promise some non-directive playtime will be very therapeutic for all of you and improve your relationship. If you have teens and or college students at home, please try your best not to micromanage. They need to become more independent, and that's harder to do now with everyone home together watching their every move. I recommend that you set a weekly family meeting to talk with your kids each week about what's working and where as a family you need to make some adjustments. I have a reference on the resource page that gives advice on how to run a successful family meeting. Let's take a moment and think about relationships with people outside our immediate family, because there are a lot of people in need of relationship right now. I'd like to think that just because we are supposed to be meaning, maintaining physical distance, this does not mean we have to be socially distant. In fact, I really dislike the term social distancing, and I really wish the powers that be had coined physical distancing as the proper term. Now more than ever, we need social support to get through this pandemic. I bet we all know someone who is struggling right now, so I have a few ideas of how you can reach out to people outside your home safely. If you know someone in need of fellowship and connection right now, even if you can't be together in person, reach out and include them in your meal times. Put the iPad or laptop on the dinner table, fire up Zoom or Skype and eat a meal together. If you are the one who is home alone and you're missing your grandkids or parents, try to connect with them in new ways. Yaya can teach a cooking lesson or Papu can play a game over the internet. Even before COVID, my mother gave my son a lesson via Skype on how to knead bread dough. 
We lined up the iPad camera by his hands and she watched how he was kneading and they gave him pointers. So there's a lot we can do with video conferencing apps like Zoom and Skype that go way beyond meetings for work. Offer respite. If you are someone who does not have young kids in your home, can you think of ways you can help someone who does? Honestly, this will benefit you as much as the person you are serving. This picture shows my boys reading to their little buddies. They did this just for fun because they love those kiddos. But as it turned out, the children stayed engaged in the story time for an hour, which means their mother had an hour to focus on something other than them. I realized that many parish ministries um, came to a screeching halt when COVID hit, but I think it's time to revive our outreach and inreach to people who are struggling through this stressful time. I encourage you all to think about ways you can help someone else and provide relief. Could you offer to tutor someone who needs help with homework? Could you start a meal train for families who are feeling overwhelmed? Is your parish making care calls to every single person in the parish, especially those living alone? My parish is, and it's been very much appreciated. How about college students who are stuck in their dorm rooms alone with little social interaction? A college care package sent from their home parish would be very meaningful. I would love to see our parish communities really rally around people who are struggling right now by offering relationship and relief. Even if we can't all be together in church every week, we can still be socially connected. We just have to get creative. Why have I focused on outreach when the topic here is self-care? Did I get off track? No, actually there are many studies that show when we serve others through service and altruism, we ourselves experience a better mood and better mental health. So again, remember relationship when you think about your own self-care. Let's take a moment and think about our relationship with God. I wonder how many of us need to stop and truly recenter our lives on Christ. It's been about seven months since the pandemic hit our country hard. Like I mentioned earlier, we're in this phase of ambiguity that we might be in for a while. So I would say that part of our current adjustment is to recenter our lives on Christ, especially if we've gotten out of the habit of our spiritual disciplines. Okay, I'm gonna venture out into what might be choppy waters, but bear with me. We said we wanted to provide a place to talk about challenges. So here are two more polling questions for us to consider. Here's the first one. All right. All right, so if you wouldn't mind answering, since my parish opened, I have been back to church in person as often as I have been able to sign up or be invited. I've a two, I've attended less often in person than I used to by my own choice. Three, I have not attended any services in person at all. So let's take a few minutes. Looks like there's a few more people maybe who could answer. All right. I'm going to end the polling and share results. So um, it looks great that many people have been back to church as often as they can. And, you know, certainly that's not weekly for many parishes, but a fair number have um, attended less and some have not attended at all. So I'm going to launch the next question as a follow-up. If you have not been back to church or are choosing to attend in person less frequently than in the past, please check all that apply about what's stopping you. One, for health reasons regarding myself or someone I'm close to, I don't feel safe going to church. Two, frankly, I'm enjoying the convenience of live stream and watching at home. Three, I want to go back, but my kids are out of the habit and now balking at going. Four, I've lost my motivation and don't see the point anymore. 
five other. And for other, feel free to put a comment in the chat. Appreciate your honesty. And I believe this is fully anonymous, right? So. Rand, it looks like there's just a couple of people who for some reason the um, poll is not showing up for. Um, oh. We're looking at maybe three or four. Um, That's strange. But we do have one uh, message in the chat that I can read if you'd like okay. to hear it. Great, yeah. It says, I have not attended my parish because they did not open soon enough. Another parish uh, within orthodoxy did, not Greek, and now I'm going there. I don't have to wear a mask and I feel more comfortable now not going to my home parish. So that was one person. Okay. Um, and then another said, we want to make sure we give everyone in the parish a chance to attend so we feel we should not go every week. Great. All right, I'm going to end the polling. I appreciate those comments. Um, Absolutely. Um, so I see that for half health reasons, and you know that's so understandable, um, that a variety of responses beyond that. Oh, I didn't share. There's the sharing. All right. All right. I'm going to close that. Thanks for sharing. All right. I asked those polling questions, not to spark debate and most Definitely not as a setup for judgment on what you and your family are doing right now. Remember what I said earlier that we all need to reflect and that reflecting on our behavior leads to thoughtful, intentional action. I believe it's time to reflect on our church attendance if we haven't already. And regardless of where you fall on the continuum of church attendance that we noted in the polls, please consider how you wanna grow in your relationship with Christ. Do you need to recenter your life on him? That might mean getting back to church if you can and feel you can do so safely with your limits. But it might also mean getting back in the habit of fasting and almsgiving if, you, if you've gotten sloppy with those during COVID. The church gives us prayer, fasting, and almsgiving to heal us during difficult times. They're actually the best self-care tools we have out there. I think we can all ask ourselves, are we going to use this unusual time during COVID as an opportunity to grow through struggle? St. Paul says in Romans 5, and not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. I'm hopeful we will all emerge from these turbulent waters, supporting each other and growing closer to God in our faith. So summarizing again, as you move forward through this fall semester with your children, remember, reflect, rejuvenate, and relationship if you want to thrive and not just survive. Let's turn to our kids now and consider what their needs are to thrive during this unprecedented school year. Let's talk about their three new three R's for 2020. Resilience, routine, and reboot. We'll take each one by one. Resilience. What is resilience? This is our ability to adapt in the face of adversity and build new skills, to weather the storm and survive. Sometimes this means to shine and be successful, but sometimes resilience might just mean getting through a challenging time with minimal dam damage. And that is exactly how we have to think about our current circumstances. In regards to education, this might mean lowering the bar a bit and setting very realistic expectations for your children. Maybe they don't actually have to complete every single homework assignment to learn the concept they're working on. Maybe they're having a bad day, really missing their friends and need more breaks than usual. You can help your child build their resilience by teaching them to identify how they're feeling and find ways to cope with that feeling. Sometimes your time is better spent with your child talking about their frustration and empathizing with it than fighting over getting their math finished. So think about building resilience by teaching your kids ways to manage their stress. Remember all those stress management techniques I just ran through? 
they are all important for your children too and can help them develop their resilience. What about routine? Routine gives kids a sense of safety and consistency, and most kids actually crave routine. When my son was three years old, he would start every day the exact same way. He'd come pitter-pattering down the stairs each morning and ask me, what day is it today, mom? And I'd tell him the day, let's say it was Friday, and then he'd ask, and what do we do on Fridays, mom? He wanted predictability and he expected routine. A few bits of advice regarding setting a routine. Try to think about breaking down routines throughout the day. Consider setting a regular morning routine, afternoon routine, and most importantly, especially for younger kids, a bedtime routine that involves a story and a prayer. Second, let your child be involved in setting that daily routine. This will empower them and could actually be an advantage to e-learning because kids can adjust their schedule to when they learn best and you as the parent can help them identify that. Be sure to include plenty of breaks throughout the day to relieve stress from staring at the screen. Plan for safe socializing with friends and family. And use kitchen timers and alerts on your devices to help kids manage their time themselves rather than you constantly nagging them. Now, one bit of caution as you set your routine, beware of another R, rigid. Please don't be severely rigid. If your child is having a rough day, if you are having a rough day, it's okay to be kind with yourself and your child and flex a little bit. A good routine is regular, not rigid. And now for the third R, reboot. What's a reboot? It's when you've loaded your computer or your gadget with so much content that it gets overloaded. And so you have to turn it off and back on to reset and refresh. I think we all need a major reboot of our screen time. And by screen time, I mean our use of computers, smartphones, iPads, TV, all of our electronic devices. I'm gonna address screen time in kids right now, but honestly, my advice is for each and every one of us adults as well. Before we dig into this subject, let me take another poll. How would you describe your child's, oh, sorry. Okay, how would you describe your child's screen time use? Choose one, constant and excessive, a decent balance of screen time and real world activities in frequent. And if you have more than one child, let's just average perhaps. Hopefully everyone can see the poll this time. Okay, I'm going to end the polling. Most, most of you have answered. All right, so constant and excessive is common and a decent balance. I'm glad to hear that. Um, it looks like a majority have a decent balance of screen time and real world activities. That's great. All right. If you know me or have heard me speak any time in the last two years, you know that I'm a huge advocate for reducing screen time for us as adults and even more so for our children. I believe in setting limits around screen use, but with e-learning, remote work from home, and minimal in-person social interaction, there's been an enormous surge in screen use. I know many families with good screen habits who basically tossed it all out the window when COVID hit. So I'd like us all to take a step back and consider how we might reboot and reconceptualize our screen time habits. So first of all, reinstate the rules that you threw out the window when COVID hit, such as shutting down screens an hour before bed and charging devices outside bedrooms at night. If at all possible, set up steady places outside the bedroom. And if your child must study in his or her bedroom, try to position the computer so that the screen faces out toward the door. And last, take screen breaks throughout the day. 
I know a lot of kids want to watch TikTok videos or Snapchat their friends during their breaks between classes, but encourage them to get up and walk around, preferably outside. Look away from the screen. Do you know what your kids are doing online? Be aware of what your kids are looking at and do that by talking to your kids about their online lives. Common Sense Media just released a report on teens and technology that I've included on the resource list. And they give some excellent advice for parents on how to start conversations with kids around their technology use. I hope you'll take the time to look at their suggestions, but in a nutshell, you wanna take a genuine interest in their online activities. Who are they following on Instagram or TikTok? What do they like about those people? How do those people make them feel? Listen to what they say without judgment. Let them know they can tell you anything about their online experiences. If you show openness and not judgment of their online activities, they will be more likely to share with you when they run into a problem. And believe me, it's not uncommon for kids to run into problems online. Now with that warning, let me also point out that screen time is not all bad. Recognize that there are benefits, especially during this time of COVID-19. This may be the only way kids can maintain their friendships and they need their friends. So rather than think about setting screen time limits, you might consider setting screen use limits. If they spend a half hour using FaceTime to connect with their grandparents, that's time well spent. An hour of mindless scrolling on TikTok is not the same as an hour creating a YouTube video or playing Minecraft with real world friends. YouTube in particular has some amazing quality content. My younger son taught himself how to play guitar from YouTube videos. YouTube taught my other son how to cook rice. So it's definitely not all bad. A good rule of thumb that is supported by numerous studies is this. If kids are using the internet or social media to connect with friends and family in pro-social ways or to do something creative, then that can benefit their overall mental health. But if they're using screens for mindless passive activities, it can lead to negative effects. Last, if you're feeling like this picture, like your phone, laptop, iPad has become a part of your body and or your child's body, I suggest you consider implementing a regular digital fast. This is something I advocate even when it's not COVID, but I think it's becoming crucial now. I wanna be clear though, I'm suggesting we do a digital fast in addition to and not in place of the fast prescribed by our Orthodox Church. Dr. Jean-Claude Larcher is a French Orthodox patristic scholar, and he's called for all Orthodox churches to introduce an explicit abstinence from the internet and social media during periods of fasting. This would allow for a regular digital detoxification or digital decluttering in the service of the development of spiritual life. Here's what he says about why we should do a digital fast. He says the abuse of new media, which has become common, produces effects contrary to those sought by fasting and abstinence. So our use of technology causes the vain exhaustion of energy, incessant internal movement and noise, an invasive occupation of time, the impossibility of establishing or maintaining inner peace, and the destruction of the attention and concentration necessary for vigilance and prayer. Strong words. Larche is basically saying that our use of tech is working against our fasting efforts and bringing us down. So if we're fasting from meat on Wednesdays and Fridays, but staying glued to our Facebook feeds at the same time, we're actually derailing our fasting efforts. Dr. Larche says further, the church must take into account these new circumstances created by our, by our time and establish appropriate rules accompanying those of fasting from food and sexual abstinence. So as to help modern man through regular voluntary limitation to free himself from the new addictions that bind him 
and so as to give him the means to lead a full it lead in full the spiritual life befitting his nature and serving as the condition for his true personal development. These are words of an Orthodox scholar put in the context of the spiritual life that many, many secular professionals in both the medical and psychological fields would agree that we need to do this for our overall mental and physical health as well. Do y'all recall seeing the film Light that Family Synaxes showed last year? Or maybe you've seen the new Netflix documentary called The Social Dilemma. In both of these films, we learn that the people who create our technology do not allow their own children to use it. Many of the former top Silicon Valley executives and inventors are proponents of what is essentially digital fasting. We're truly in a bind today because we need our technology for just about everything and we can be truly grateful for it especially when it helps us stay connected to the people we love and can't be with physically. But we have to look at our non-essential use of our devices and consider fasting from them when we fast from food. So to wrap up tonight, I wanna to offer a bonus R. Rejoice. Really? You sure about that? How can we be happy during a pandemic? Well, actually, I'm not suggesting that you focus on being happy. I'm reminding you that there's true joy that can be found anywhere, anytime, even in suffering. Christ said, my joy I give unto you that your joy may be full. So I wanna leave you with this last arrow prayer to reflect on as you move through this pandemic. This is the day the, which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you. All right. All right. Miranda, we have our first question already. Awesome. Let's hear it. Okay. It's uh, anonymous. Um, it says, for teens, how much uh, social creative screen time do you think is acceptable? Hmm. Well, I would look at the balance between that social screen time and real world screen time, or real world interaction, excuse me, um, that can be done safely. Um, so it's really, sometimes it's about looking at what kids aren't doing if they're on their screens. Um, and it may be that, um, you know, they definitely need that social interaction, but they also need exercise. They need to go to church. They need to maybe help in the house. So I would look at the overall balance of what's going on. And, and again, think less about the amount of time and what they're doing. So, thank helps. you. All right, we have um, another question that just came in. This one is from Sarah. She says, since I have been letting my kids use the screens a lot more than normal because I'm trying to get work done, then how do I scale back without them getting super upset? Yeah, you have to go slow. First of all, I empathize with that. I really do because, um, you know, the television and the computer really do draw our kids in and occupy their attention well so that we can get other things done. It's, that's, that's why often we use them. Um, but I think what helps is to wean them off a little at a time. You can't just turn the TV off and say, that's it, you know, you're not going to have any more screen time, but um, wean them off a little at a time. And then, um, and this is where it takes more effort, I'm sorry, especially if you're a working parent to trying to get your own job done. You need to replace the screen with a hobby or an interest that will occupy them. And I know some kids are better at occupying themselves without a screen than others. Um, and so it may take a little work to find with that what that interest is, um, but they will be better for it in the long run. So. All right, we don't have any other questions yet. Okay. I think you gave us a lot to really like digest. 
I know. <laughs> really, I told really you I was loading it tonight. <laughs> and it is um, Friday night, but yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, okay, so say the household is just way off balance for adults and kids really overusing screen time. Do you recommend starting with one or the other, <laughs> making changes? Yeah, can you guess what I'm gonna say? <laughs> I think that we have to be good role, mo role models for our kids and I think we have to start with ourselves. Um, and so I would encourage parents to put their own screens away and look their kids in the eyes, offer to play a game. Um, you know, if you, if you look at the screen time app on your own phone, or if you have an Android, I think there's something similar. Um, you know, it, it counts how much time you spend on your, on your device. And if you look at it and realize, wow, that's a lot of time I could be doing something else. Um, you know, I think you'll model for your kids, um, you know, better behavior, so. Sure, yeah, thank you. All right, we have a couple more questions rolling in. Uh, face. <laughs> <laughs> one is um, from Katie. She says, I'm a planner and it's been hard to live one day at a time. Any advice on the best way to do this? To live one day at a time? Sure, so let's go back to all of those self-care points I made earlier. Um, I think when you do implement things like healthy living, uh, regular prayer, uh, breathing calmly, it allows you to stay in the moment a bit more um, and be able to take it one day at a time. But I empathize with you, Katie. I'm a planner too, and um, it is super challenging. We have to learn, um, again, to live in that ambiguity and to aim to be flexible. Thank you. Okay, we have another one. Um, what is the best way to start getting our kids back to church? Great question. All right. Well, um, I guess I'm wondering if you've been, well, I'll just uh, try and speak more generally, not even um, just to one person, but um, certainly if you've been using the live stream for your parish all along, um, then that helps. If you haven't, if you've been just doing nothing, I would say start with the live stream um, one week to sort of prep them for, okay, now we're going back um, and then sign up and go. You know, I think if you were a regular churchgoer or at least a semi-regular churchgoer before, your kids will feel that sort of welcoming, presence that you get when you go back to church after not having been there for a while. Um, and at the end of the day, you really, you just have to pack up and go. So. Sometimes easier said than done, but I think that's a great encouragement. Absolutely. They may fight you, you know, and there may be a little crying. There may be a little, I don't want to wear that dress or I'd rather sleep in, but we're Orthodox Christians and we go to church on Sunday. So. And maybe they'll surprise us with their response too. Um, I mean, you might even hear, oh good, I get to see father again. <laughs> <laughs> um, sort of on the same note of Sunday schedule, um, it says our Sunday school decided to not restart out of fear of the virus. While I'm sad about this, I want to make sure I make the most for my children. What is a good way to foster religious education at home? Great question. There are so many resources out there. Um, you know, certainly the GOA has great resources. Um, that's if you want to get creative and fancy, but honestly, you can start with something as simple as getting a children's Bible. I'm not sure how old your kids are, but um, even just establishing the regular habit of reading the Bible daily is religious education in the home. Um, observing the fast days and the feast days, also religious education in the home, and um, picking a project for almsgiving, um, again, religious education. 
if we think about religious education as being more than just memorizing the books of the Bibles or, um, you know, uh, learning in a classroom, it's experience. And we live our faith, again, through prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. So I would encourage those practices actively in the home. We had somebody in the chat pipe in that um, maybe it's a possibility, uh, going back one question, that a family could schedule one-on-one -on -one time with the priest um, to help ease the children back into church. It's a great suggestion. Absolutely. Um, and Katie also uh, chimed in that uh, Ascension of Our Lord, Father Sotiri there, does a Sunday school lesson at the end of liturgy. So you can actually, anyone, can go on their church website to see the previous lessons. So oh, if your parish isn't offering something like that, it's a great opportunity. Wonderful. That's great. Thank you for sharing that, Katie. Right. Because again, I mean, it's beauty of the benefit of all this technology is that we can share resources across parishes that we would not normally. Um, so that's nice to know about Father Sotiri. End of liturgy. What time is liturgy, Katie? I will let you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm just curious about what time that little Sunday school lesson pops up for people, like in case they want to watch their own live stream and then catch Sunday school. Sure, uh, if they are telling us 9.30. Is there... 9.30, all right. So maybe by 10.30 or so, 11. Okay. Um, all right, so we've got a new topic here. Um, Sarah asks uh, about asking you to reflect a little bit on the psychological effect that the pandemic, specifically the masks, might be causing. Um, thinking about our communication, that it's hard now when you can't hear somebody when they're talking, you can't see all of their emotions um, and so much of what they're trying to communicate when they're talking with a mask on to you. Um, mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit about that? It is a challenge. This is why I'm preferring to do my sessions with my clients via telehealth rather than in person because you can't see their emotional face. I, I think time will tell. Um, I'm not aware of studies looking specifically at the impact of mask wearing on a child's development, but I can see where, again, not being able to read visual emotional cues, you know, could put a damper on development, but, you know, we're not in masks 24-7, um, so uh, there's a lot we don't know. Sorry, I wish I knew more, um, but it's what we have to do, and it's, you know, certainly better than getting sick and or watching our loved ones, especially our older loved ones, get ill. So. Um. We have, let's see, oh, a, a request for any ideas of books or resources that you would recommend for middle schoolers to grow in their faith. So um, that I'm going to say either Randa or if anybody wants to type that Anyone. into the chat and I'll share those out. Well, the ones that immediately come to mind, again, I'm a boy mom, so <laughs> the ones that come to mind for, for me that my kids loved, um, were, you know, certainly the Chronicles of Narnia, which, you know, that might be a little young for middle school, but at, by middle school, they're really able to appreciate the symbolism in those books. Um, and of course, my husband is listening in the other room, and I'm sure he's going to tell me, if you don't say the Lord of the Rings, then, <laughs> you know, what kind of woman are you? So um, specifically Orthodox books, um, I would look through the Ancient Faith Radio catalog, uh, or Ancient Faith Publishing, excuse me. Um, they are coming out with more and more fiction for teens um, that is quite good from what I understand. I've not actually read myself. I'm wondering what other people have, if anyone else has input there. I know my daughter's favorite is a book called Icon. It's a dystopian novel uh, about an Orthodox Christian girl. Oh, it's cool. incredible. It's, it's kind of intense, but it's incredible and great for middle school. Nice. nice. Um, we have another question here, uh, anonymous. It says, my son has been more quiet lately. He's a teenager and I know he's been feeling cooped up at home, especially during COVID. 
I want to encourage him to spend more time with family, but I know he just wants to hang out with friends. How do I encourage my son to come out of his room and be more social with his family without being annoying? <laughs> Give him a reason to come out of that room, right? Um, you know, it's a challenging time um, and you have to strike a balance, um, but I, you know, seriously, give him a reason to come out of the room um, and engage him in something that he likes to do. Um, and, you know, we're able to start getting out a little bit more and more safely. So um, even if you take him for a ride or, you know, take him um, to pick up takeout food, uh, you know, something that will grab his attention uh, is good. And remember that family game where you just play and you don't criticize while you play. Those are great suggestions. Somebody else chimed in, um, have him pick a movie and do a pizza night as a family. Absolutely. Um, and then another book suggestion, kind of jumping around here as the things come in the chat, is Voyage to the Rock is oh, another that. book that is um, recommended. Uh, moving on, we have another question um, related to Sunday school again. My teenagers are sick of remote meetings and refuse to attend virtual Sunday school. Any suggestions? Well, I don't blame them. <laughs> and um, yeah, um, I, I would encourage then reading, um, finding some, you know, if they're teens, they can start to read adult books that are orthodox. Um, you know, is it possible, I, I don't, obviously I don't know who asked that or what church they're going to or, you know, what this church school situation is, but I wonder if there's a way for a small um, in-person gathering even of church school students. Um, I know some churches are starting to do that. Um, I think a lot of empathy it is really hard to be on your screen all the time, but if they're gonna, if they're going to church, uh, if you if it's if you feel safe taking them um, and they're attending liturgy, I would worry a little less about Sunday school. To be perfectly honest, okay, and I think that has wrapped up the questions. Um, if anybody, this will be the final call. If anybody out there has a question that is on the tip of their tongue, we'll give it another minute. Um, we did, I wanted to let you know, Randa, that we had um, some comments earlier about um, one of the hardest things being the decision fatigue, that literally just every single decision, is this safe, should we participate, um, is exhausting. It is. I agree. I agree. And I think, um, you know, again, one thing that I find helpful is to not spend too much time reading, especially opinion pieces or blog posts. You know, if you're going to read something about coronavirus, make sure you're picking a reputable source, because I think that does help with the decision making. Um, I think part of the pull is, well, I read this, and then I read that, and someone told me this, and someone told me that, and so it's like, ah, what do I believe? What do I, you know? Um, so try and stay focused on reputable sources um, and keep all the other noise out, and I think the decisions are a little easier then. Well, um, no other questions have come up. so. Any final reflections, Randa, before we close? Um, yeah, no, just um, thank you again for welcoming me here tonight. And um, again, I just encourage everyone to stick together through this the best that we can. I think Family Synaxis, um, I don't know who's in the audience tonight, but I imagine if it's most of the folks who typically come, you know, it's a great group. Um, and I think talking about these things together and encouraging each other is you know, the best that we can do right now. 
Christine, do you want to close out with anything? Unmute. Okay. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, I just want to thank Dr. Anderson for her presentation, all the time she put into those slides and such a nice overall summary of what we're all struggling with and such great ideas. Um, so thank you everyone for attending. Thank you. Um, reminder about next month, our in-person retreat on November 14th. So make your plans now and watch for details and watch for those resources that Dr. Anderson also prepared for us. And um, I hope you enjoyed the evening. Uh, does Father Sam have anything to say? No, again, thank you to Dr. Anderson and to everyone that participated tonight. And again, the 14th of November at St. Nicholas for our in-person uh, in retreat. So we look forward to uh, the retreat. And again, thank you to Doctor for, for your insight and for some valuable knowledge to help with these little ones. <laughs> <laughs> Can you offer us a closing prayer, Father? Sure. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Well, Lord our God, we thank you for allowing us to gather this evening for the words of wisdom, we ask that you watch over each and every one of us, watch over our loved ones, guide us to do your will, and watch over those who are afflicted with illness, who are afflicted with this virus. This we ask in your holy name. Amen. Everyone have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.